there was this guy who brought this sauce called the Holy Trinity, and it had scorpion, reaper, and then ghost. I actually thought it was pretty good. I put it in my dinga. You're like, needs more. One guy literally ran away crying. To poop. That's what I would do. Welcome back to the Shaking Not Scared podcast. Here with you as always, your hosts, Eric and Vivi. Today we're going to be talking about the 1997 film Scream 2, directed by Wes Craven. But before we get into that, how are you, Vivi? I'm thriving. Thriving? It's October. But it's over. It's almost over. This is the last week of spooky season. And it's almost our anniversary. So we still have some celebrations. But yeah, we still have some stuff to do. Like we said, we do Day of the Dead the next day. There's still plenty to do. Salem Horror Fest is still not over. We're going to a Halloween party this weekend. I hope the costumes are ready by Saturday. It's going to be funny. Can't wait to tell what happened. Yeah. <laughs> and we're also going live on Sunday, day of Halloween, with A Nightmare on Fear Street. So Woo! it's going to be exciting. Yeah. Keep an eye out for that. It'll be, I think, 2 p.m. Cool. Well, that's all I got for what's going on this week. What do you have for creepy content? Okay. Okay, we actually watched a lot of stuff because we hate ourselves. We stayed up till like three every night this week. We finished Midnight Mass and oh boy. I feel bad saying this because people really like this. This just dragged on for so long. Not that it wasn't good. I don't think the payoff was there for me because I kept waiting and waiting and waiting for like a crazy payoff for certain characters and stuff and it's just that I didn't get that. And there was also so much, so much religious subtext that I am not a fan of personally, very personally. What I would say summarize your review of it was way to make vampires boring. Yeah. I mean, it was a cool looking monster for sure. So many religious elements of the vampire being like the fallen angel and and you've probably already seen it. It's late October now. The dialogue is repeated so much. I think the problem is that because you are going to have people who binge this, there's what, nine episodes? You're hearing the same thing said over and over and over again. It's almost like you're pushing religion on me as the viewer and I don't like it. (laughs) Yeah, that's the part I did not like. Also, I've seen people call it midnight monologues instead of midnight mass. But if you're going to want to binge something, we also watch Squid Games. Ooh, so good. It was so good. From the premise, it reminded me of Battle Royale, which you need to watch because it's like the better version of the Hunger Games. Yeah, apparently Battle Royale was a book way before Hunger Games. Oh, so you looked into it? Yeah, I might read the book, actually. Cool. Yeah, Squid Game was so good. I loved every bit of it. I don't think I hated anything about it, actually. There was one thing I hated. (laughs) Who dies at the end? Spoiler alert if you haven't seen it. Yeah, skip ahead. I honestly thought that, I think her name is... I apologize for pronunciation ahead of time. Mm -hmm. She's the girl Mm -hmm. who is the pickpocket. I thought she was going to survive along with Jihoon. Oh, that made me mad. The guy with the glasses, I forgot his name. The worst. The worst person. Because he had no reason to be there. He killed Ali. Korean horror makes such good villains. They do. I love the old man the whole time. I had issues with him. Why? Because the big twist at the end is he's actually the game master. And he's like, it was fun to play. I'm like, yeah, it's fun to play when your life isn't actually on the line. He was likable up until that. Up until that point. And I think I told you when we watched this, I don't like this theme TV shows sometimes have where they make a really strong female character, like really badass, and then they die to further the plot of the male protagonist. Because again, kind of like you said, I think she could have won it. She like lost on a fluke. Yeah, we're not entirely sure how the male versus female relationship works in Korea. Mm -hmm. Being from Hispanic culture, we know that machismo is a big thing. You brought up that maybe it's like a machismo thing there too. But when you think back to like Train of Busan, he dies for the girl and his daughter to survive so maybe not so much i don't know i feel like it's that thing of because you know we have the final girl right and that's fine but if like a strong female lead wins it makes it a female movie and that's not the same with if a male wins so like i was seeing it that way i honestly thought she was gonna win or i thought so too anyway yeah (laughs) go watch it tell us what you think the other thing we did was we played true of a pursuit ultimate horror edition while watching hocus pocus you know we originally said we're not the most knowledgeable horror fans Play this game (laughs) and realize how much you don't know. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it says ultimate horror because it's talking about graphic novels and books we haven't read oh my God. along and with film. The smallest of details, too. Yeah. It's like, what book was blah, blah, blah character reading in this random book that you've never heard of? We're talking about using this to maybe learn about more content, too, just because yeah. there were things in there I'd never even heard of. Yeah, we really sucked. So is that it for creepy content? I think so. Okay. Did you have any comfort content? No, that's the thing. I think I forgot to watch comfort content. <laughs> Because <laughs> we were staying up to watch horror. <laughs> Listen, comfort content comes after October. I would actually say that playing Scott Pilgrim oh, the yeah. other night was 
comfort contact. Comfort, yeah, because it's not really horror, but it was beating people up <laughs> like the movie. And we could just not get past this one level. Oh my god, Todd destroyed us through yeah. walls. We, we just kept losing lives. I thought it was a cutscene, honestly, and you were like, he's killing us. And I was like, no, I think it's a cutscene. <laughs> yeah, no, we're going to try and play again to get past that one level. I think that was like level three. <laughs> it really was, so that doesn't bode well for us. We need more friends so they can come play with us. Yeah, definitely think it'd be easier with a couple more players. But what drink do we have this week? Here's what I did. We were pretty set on making a michelada. With Brandy's character being killed in a white van, went to the store and found a white van beer by Solemn Oath. So... We're going to make this a Randy Lala. <laughs> yeah, and we pretty much followed a traditional michelada recipe. Other than that, we're using different types of ingredients. Specifically, we're going to use Valentina, the black label, which is the spicier version. If you haven't heard of Valentina, it's a very common Mexican uh, spicy salsa. It's everywhere. I feel pretty sad if you haven't heard of Valentina. It's good. Then we're going to use Solemn Oath's white van white ale. We've had micheladas with blue moon Belgian white, so I thought something similar would be good with this. So do you want to try it? Sure. I'm nervous for this because all I've eaten today is a donut. Same. Apple cider donuts. I think I'm going to add my hot sauce first. And we left the hot sauce to the side so we can make it as spicy or not as spicy. Why is it spicy? Yep. That tastes like a michelada. I really like it. Definitely tastes better than a blue moon Belgian white. It's pretty good. I, I like the can too. Did you yeah. see there's a demon dog on there? That's what I was about to say. I like the artwork. So it's from Solomon Muff Brewing, like we said. It says it's a torrent of orange dreamsicle pulled from the soul of Belgian tradition. What do you rate the michelada? It's pretty good. I'm not a huge michelada person. I know there's people who would hear me say that and be like, that's sacrilege. You're Mexican. How dare you? But you gave me the other option of doing a Bloody Mary or this. And I was like, Bloody Mary sounds worse. At least the beer gives it a different flavor. I don't know. I'm torn. I'm going to give it a three because I like it more than I thought I would. I think maybe the white man gives it a good flavor. True that. I'm going to give this a four. Nice. Go try this. The Randy Lava because Randy dies in a white van and mm -hmm. it's pooled with blood. Which is upsetting because I really liked his character. So did I. Cheers to Randy. To the horror movie enthusiast in this film. I can't imagine the movies after this without him. I wonder if they do that thing where he didn't actually die and he came back. Oh, he's clearly dead. I don't know. We'll talk about that in Fun Facts. Oh, really? <laughs> Do you uh, get into them? Yes. I noticed this when we started the film. We usually look up the year. We saw it was 1997. I was like, damn, didn't the original come out in 1996? And it did. This movie was made incredibly quickly. Less than a year after the release of the first movie, it was released in December. The script was hastily written while the first movie was still in production. They actually have some rumors about this script. A lot of people think originally the killer was going to be Sydney's new boyfriend and her best friend Haley working together that leaked online so they had to quickly rewrite the ending and change it but no the director actually wrote quite a few dummy scripts just in case they would get released and he said the killers were always meant to be mickey and mrs loomis that's pretty cool i think scream is such a interesting franchise that is self-aware you never know yeah it's yeah. always criticizing itself so i don't know if you caught this but there are several references to other casts Members like Monica from Friends, <laughs> Courtney Cox, they mentioned a lot of the actors from Friends. At the time, Nev Campbell was working on a popular TV show and they mentioned characters from that show. The ones that stood out to me the most were, so the fake film within the film, they- Called Stab. Yeah, called Stab. And they mentioned that Tori Spelling plays Sydney and that David Schwimmer plays Dewey's character. David Schwimmer is obviously Ross from Friends. And then later on, Gail's character talks about how she had her nudes leaked on the internet somehow and that it actually wasn't her. It was her face photoshopped on top of Jennifer Aniston's body, who is obviously Rachel from Friends. <laughs> you mentioned someone is obviously dead, right? And this, Randy. I think, is going to come into play with Scream 5 later on. In the first film, Matthew Lillard's character is stabbed. Stu, we obviously assume that he's dead. And this might add to the lore of why he might be coming back for the fifth. In the sorority party scene, you can see him as one of the background characters. Lillard? Lillard. Oh, can you really? Did you yeah. see it? I did not. I, when I found that fact, I'm like, hmm, this might be why people are like, he never really died. He's coming back for the fifth, which I think has pretty much been confirmed, right? I don't know. He literally was found dead. Check they dropped dead. a TV on Matthew Lillard's head. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Those TVs are heavy. I don't know. Yeah. Hard to come back from that one. But he is in the background. Apparently, he went to visit the set during recording and they made him a background character. That makes me want to go back and check 
to see if we can spot them. I know. I'm sure someone's done it for us and we can find a picture online. Yeah, we could probably find a YouTube video. The final fun fact that I thought was pretty funny is Wes Craven tried to trick the censor process. You know, when your film gets rated, R, it limits who can see it, obviously. So he actually ended up sending in a much bloodier, gorier version of the film with the expectation that they would tell him, no, you need to cut down all this. He would then present the one he actually wanted and it would probably get away with a lower rating. Unfortunately, the bloodier, gorier version he presented passed, but they gave it an R rating still. Oh. So didn't work out for him. Damn. That's kind of smart, though. Yeah, it's definitely worth a shot. This was rated R. I didn't know that. Yeah, I wouldn't say maybe because we've just seen some like way gorier things. Isn't there like a limit? They say fuck a lot. I think there's like a limit on how many times you can say that word. In Before, a PG-13. which I don't understand. Once it's so strange. hearing it is enough, probably. I don't know. They're like, you know what? All the kills you want, but the F word once nay, nay. or it's got to go. I'm sorry. Yeah, spicy. Yeah. And those are the fun facts I have. Perfect. I liked it. This movie is so fun. I still really like this franchise. So do I. Are you ready to do your timed? Let's go. All right. Ready? One. Oh, wait, wait. wait. Yes. Two, <laughs> three, go. So the movie is actually a lot like the first one in that a lot of things play out the same way that they do. In the beginning, we get introduced to some characters that end up dying, but they get they uh, you think the whole time that they're going to be important. They actually die right away because they're in the poster. Don't even make it past like the first 10 minutes. They die. You get introduced to all of the same characters from the beginning. Everyone's back. They're in Ohio in a college, and everyone's like really, really focused on Nev, and they're like thinking that something's going on because these kids were killed. They think there's a copycat killer. The whole movie is basically spent them trying to figure out who the killer is and why it's happening. At the end, we get revealed that it's actually Billy's mom that is the killer. Uh, a lot of framing happenings. Uh, a lot of framing happens where they think that uh, it's just it's just uh, his mom, and then it's actually Mickey, this other guy, and there's a lot of confusion. And uh, basically, Nev and Gail are the ones who save the day. And Cotton from the first one somehow also is there. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Are you done? Yeah. Okay. You had like 10 seconds left. Okay. I, I thought I was going to have a hard time with it being two hours. I didn't articulate my thoughts. So It's okay. You were as confused as this movie. I wish that I would have known how much time I had left so I could just get a little bit. That's deeper. not how this works. Fine. Take what you get. It's wrong. It's right. You got it. This is what you want in the it first place. It is what I wanted. <laughs> okay. IMDB overview. Sydney and a tabloid reporter, Gail Weathers, survived the events of the first scream, but their nightmare isn't over. When two college students are murdered at a sneak peek of stab a movie based on the events of the first film it's clear a copycat killer is on the loose sydney and gail as well as the fellow survivor deputy dewey and randy have to find out who is behind the new murder spree before they all end up dead oh my god this movie is so meta so many layers ready yeah we open on a movie theater it seems like it's opening night for the movie stab based on the events of the first film This film opens very similar to the first film where you're introduced to characters who you think are going to be the main characters, only to discover that they are going to be killed within the first 10 minutes of the film. We get introduced to Jada Pinkett's character, whose name is Maureen, and her boyfriend, Phil. They're talking about... Kind of like the first one where it was self-aware. She hates scary movies. It's always a white woman. She's saying those points like in the first film where Drew Barrymore's character was saying the same thing about They always run in the wrong direction. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of commentary about black characters in horror films. I think this is like one of the first times we've seen a black character in the group of friends. So this is something that I was going to touch on later anyway, but we could probably dive into it now. With the movie trying to make this commentary, I don't know what it's trying to achieve, right? It talks a lot about African Americans and horror. What I don't understand with this movie being so self-aware is, is it trying to say we are trying to do better and have these African American characters in here? Because it doesn't necessarily do that. Later, we talked about how Randy refers to Hallie possibly being a suspect and then refers to her as Candyman's daughter. Just because Candyman is the only black horror prominent icon that we know of. And we're like, is that racist? Well, we don't know because the movie's trying to say something about African Americans in horror. I would say the message is very unclear because it makes all these statements and then goes to do the thing that it says it kills every African American character in the whole film, except for Joel, because he has a God given sense, sense yeah. to get out of there. <laughs> when he said your last cameraman got slaughtered, and she's Hell like, no. "No, he just got his head bashed in." Joel's like, "The fucking Tom, that is it dead lady." <laughs> yeah. But 
whether it's trying to be smart about it or not, I think at the end of the day, because it still does what it says horror movies do, I don't know whether it's a good thing or bad thing to have done it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, because Scream has done this thing where it will tell you what happens. It will tell you the tropes and then still do them. But I don't know. Maybe we're looking at this from like a new perspective, right? Like in the 90s, that was just funny. Now where we are looking for more representation, it could be like us trying to find meaning in something that they maybe didn't mean to or maybe they did it's hard to tell we're unclear on what this movie's message is about race in horror movies they go in and watch this movie i've never been to a movie theater one that had a horror movie where everybody was just going balls to the wall throwing shit dressed up as the character from the movie so this does happen it usually happens with rocky horror where people dress like the characters and throw food at the screen the thing that i think is a very sad indicator of the times this was a time where you could wear a mask in a movie theater obviously it's now been and mass shootings but there have been crimes committed in movie theaters now that you can't wear a mask anymore to go see a movie because you used to be able to what i thought you were going to say was for a movie to come out themed on the murders of a bunch of kids in a completely different state and then have this type of a following i don't know that this could happen even today anymore <laughs> with cancel culture being a thing it's funny that you mentioned that scream is actually based on murders in florida this is what i mean by this film is layers upon layers because i think it comments on the true crime community un knowingly years later I'm sure it existed at the time like this as well. But Scream is based off a bunch of murders committed by Danny Rowland in Florida. Scream has a cult following based on a murder. The way that in this film, of the film, Stabbed has a cult following based on the murders. It's crazy. And then like at the end, Cotton's getting questioned by the news and they're like, can you give us a comment on what happened? And he's like, wait till the movie. Which makes me think, is he going to create his own other movie that's not Stab? I think he means wait till part two of Stab comes out. Did Cotton do Stab 1? No. But, you know, he's a character in there. He's catching his break. Honestly, and I think it's also a commentary on how people involved with true crime, when they are not the victim, reach fame and money in some sort of way. That's exploiting what makes you, the victims. Makes you suspicious of a lot of those people, too. Don't get me wrong. I, like, listen to literally fucking everything true crime. But it also feels very strange that people profit off real life deaths of people. You imagine I die, and let's say my case goes crazy viral. You wouldn't see a dime of what... The podcasters and everyone else is making off my death and you knew me. So, you were literally my wife. <laughs> yeah. I just think like this is how these victims' families have to feel. Again, we're literally Isn't only in the first minute of this movie. The movie is heavily spent on let's reintroduce a lot of the characters that survived from the first one and then make you suspicious of every single one. With the help of Randy. Randy's like everyone's a suspect. Except what he said in the first one. Yeah. So the theater is full of people who are just having a blast. They've got glow in the dark knives. Everyone's being handed ghost face costumes. And Maureen says like things that probably a lot of horror movie watchers say i think i say this all the freaking time on screen the drew barrymore character is getting naked and maureen's like what does this have to do with the plot (laughs) i think i say that at least once on every episode it's just pure eye candy for the male gaze male gaze yeah maureen takes a break goes to get popcorn and overhears some people in the line talking about like this is actually kind of fucked up this is a movie based on the real murders that happened in woodsboro california she already doesn't want to be there but she runs into phil who spooks her wearing the ghost face mask he's like all right i'm gonna meet you back in there i'm gonna go to the bathroom he goes to a stall he does something that i don't know why you would ever do he leaves the door open leaves well one leaves the door open and then overhears someone saying something about like mommy in the stall next to them and then puts his head against to hear what they're saying like i don't give a fuck about anybody in this bathroom i'm trying to pee and get back to my movie i honestly say one of those people who doesn't even leave to pee i was gonna I say wanna... they're getting up a lot throughout <laughs> this movie i want to see everything that happens i'm not gonna take a break i don't care how much i have to pee myself yeah me always because i <laughs> have to pee like all the time (laughs) you really do later obviously we find out that the killer is billy's mom and i felt like her saying the mommy this mommy that or we don't know maybe it was mickey during this time because it seems like a more filled out character barry jason Voorhees, mrs Voorhees, where she's talking to herself the kill her mommy kill her the voice is very feminine randy in the beginning describes how friday the 13th turned the tables on horror because miss Voorhees was always a really great killer and that's what we end up getting also i want to point this out before i forget it loomis so are they inspired by the detective in halloween one i think it's all just yeah scream the franchise is like a playground for horror fans and i think that's why it's so loved so So he puts his head against the stall and then the real ghost face stabs him through the stall. The strongest fucking knife ever stabs him in the head and dies. Meanwhile, Maureen's in the theater 
Ghostface goes back wearing Phil's clothing. She doesn't realize that it's not him. She notices his blood on the jacket. Ghostface turns around and just stabs her. On the theater screen, it's Drew Barrymore's death scene. And so she's screaming in the film. Maureen's screaming in real life. Maureen's getting stabbed like crazy. There are people in the background who start to realize that she's got that real blood on her. Blood. It isn't yeah. until she stands in front of the screen and literally screams with blood coming out of her mouth at the people that people realize, oh, shit. Oh, this might be real. Oh, no. Yeah. So she dies. Open credits to Happy Go Lucky College in Ohio. We mm-hmm. see Sydney waking up to a phone call and the person on the other side of the line asking what's your favorite scary movie at this point sydney has gotten caller id (laughs) because it's readily available in the late 90s and she's saying who is this i can tell you your name and your phone number and they're like oh shit apparently this has been happening for a while because she is the quote-unquote unofficial star of this film and again a commentary on how true crime can get out of control and then the people who actually survive something traumatic can be harassed by the public we meet her roommate Callie, who we find out is studying psychology and is in the process of pledging to a sorority on campus. Ooh, pledging. Oh, this film and Greek life. <laughs> <laughs> what I had a problem with in this whole film is that everything happens so fast. Like the fact that she said that this was being written at the same time as the first and they had to change so many things. You can kind of tell with how much is going on at all Once. times. You get introduced to so many things. So in the background, we're seeing that on the TV, Cotton from the first one, the guy who was wrongfully accused is on the news talking about how thanks to Gail he has been pronounced innocent and is going on this kind of like tour to say yeah, how innocent media he is. Tour. At the same time, Hallie is concerned about Sydney because it seems like she's been isolating a lot. I know her friend's studying to be a therapist, but Sydney needs a therapist. She's seen some shit. And then if she goes on to be in five other movies, she needs even more therapy. I was thinking about that. I was like, can't imagine going to movie five and then not knowing what to expect. Yeah. I don't know how she would be so trusting to have another boyfriend given what had just happened. But that comes into play later because she starts to lose trust in him. How soon after I died and did all this to you, would you be willing to go date someone again? I mean, I'm trying to think of this in the mindset of a teenager who's probably like riddled with hormones. And then you go to college and you meet a ton of new people. Like the normal teenage experience, you'd probably find a boyfriend soon. But yeah, you had something pretty traumatic happen to you. I don't know. I think what we see a lot in these horror movies is that no matter how traumatic some shit happened, your friends all died in your house, literally in front of you, you still go back to school because that's how traumatic school is. Wes Craven loves people getting an education, okay? (laughs) If that's the moral story. That is the takeaway from all these horror movies. (laughs) No matter how many people die in your house, go back to to school. school. So you can die on the inside. Just kidding, stay in school. Yeah. Right after that, the news shows the death of the couple. And immediately as she leaves that house, the news crowds the crap out of her. Because they were students at her school. The media is like, well, Sydney's here. It's got to be related, right? The next scene we get is Randy in a film theory class where they're discussing the murders. And we get Buffy. I will never not see her as Buffy. (laughs) Sarah Michelle Gellar. Her character is Cece. They're discussing the murders and basically touching on a theme that was prevalent in the first film of our movies to blame for the violence of others. And they're all debating it. Movies will never be the reason people go to kill. It's always going to be the fault of the person who does it. Movies are just there. Randy is in the classroom and basically saying, like, I was actually there. And I think this is also something that happens in true crime where they want to be very dismissive of the actual victims and just speculate. Because they're having fun with it. They are. And this conversation then leads into there are sequels that are never better than the original. And they're arguing that there are some sequels that are better than the original. And it becomes an ongoing joke throughout the rest of the film. Anytime anybody encounters Randy, they're like, what about this one? He's like, no, and points out what the flaws were in that sequel. I did want to say that, like, I was never in classes where the debates or the discussions were like this involved. People did not want to be there. Did not want to be there. No, they did want to be there. They were having a beer. (laughs) (laughs) They didn't want to be there and they weren't talking in class. So I was like, this rarely happens in college. I would have loved to be in this class, though. Y- y'all really into movies. It does tend to happen more in, like, the film theory classes. I'll yeah. give them that. Damn it. Why did I go to engineering school? I'm glad you did. Otherwise, we'd both be poor. The funnest class I ever took was music. And it was not even the music I thought it was going to be. It was, like, Baroque and Renaissance music. <laughs> It was broke. Broke music. It was broke people music. (laughs) Yeah. So right as the class is about to end, Randy is asked, how would you end the best sequel? And he's like, I'd have the geek get the girl. And then just walks out. Randy runs into Sid, who we also find out has another boyfriend named Derek. Randy and her are discussing what has just happened. And it's very clear that they are like trauma bound. But it's that thing I think we discussed a couple weeks ago where 
Even though they share the same experience, they're not together romantically. He's aware of it, too. He's like, I'm the loser friend who's the love slave of Sydney. I know. I get it. I know what I am. Yeah. <laughs> That's why I love him. I'm so sad he's dead. We got introduced to Derek, who is supposed to be the great, perfect boyfriend. And Randy is, like, super annoyed with him being there. This guy who plays Derek, why does he sound like a middle-aged man? I think he's supposed to be, like, a little snobby because he's pre-med. Derek acts like, well... Am I supposed to be understanding? Am I supposed to do this? Yeah. Almost seems annoyed at having to deal with what Sydney's going through. Yeah. His character, I find very just meh. We also get reintroduced to Gail, who now has a different haircut. (laughs) You said that this was filmed like immediately after the first. A lot of the characters look very different. I think they just got haircuts. Randy looks different. He's got the sideburns and like a new goatee. Yeah. Even Nev looks more swole a little bit. She does. Like she's been working out. (laughs) Yeah. Like, yeah. Fighting (laughs) off those crazy people. Let's say in the real world that you were attacked by a psycho probably a logical response after that is i gotta get swole (laughs) gail is still a bitch yeah she's talking on the phone with somebody and is like oh my god yeah they're gonna have the biggest weekend in opening history she's a very money hungry dead inside reminds me kind of like princess carolyn from bojack the way she's just talking really fast in business yeah although i like princess carolyn more yeah i love princess carolyn (laughs) so surprise surprise dewey didn't die in the first film they turn around and like oh look it's dewey and he's just standing by a tree lost super lost (laughs) Like, he's never seen a college in his life. (laughs) He ended up there out of nowhere. Someone warped him there. We find out that Dewey did acquire some injuries. He kind of has, like, a limp. This is very much an able actor playing someone who has a disability because there's times where he doesn't have it. He's got a severed nerve, right? Is what he said? Yes. Do with that what you will. I get so confused with these films because of the Scary Movie franchise. Oh my god, yeah. That opening scene with Jada. It happens almost shot for shot. Yeah, where she's yelling at the screen. (laughs) In the Scary Movie, isn't Dewey's character, the cop, also like a suspect? Doesn't he end up being the killer in one of them? I think in later films, Dewey's actually one of the Is it this or Scary Movie? That's what I'm saying. The, those... we, the world may never know. Just kidding. We'll watch it. We'll yeah. get to it. <laughs> These Lambda girls, Delta Lambdas, want to recruit Sydney. So bad. To get the hype around what's going on. They almost come off like mean girls. It's four of them. Hallie's already pledging. And they treat her like crap. And are kind of only nice to her because she's good friends with Sydney. Well, she's a pledge. So. Yeah, but they are very obviously using her to get to Sid. Well, she's a pledge, so. I didn't do any of that nonsense. <laughs> I had like post-traumatic stress from, from this. pledging. I was recruiting chair for a while. For the listener, I went to a school that absolutely was not a party school. We did not have this type of college experience. Recruiting on a campus like this, I'm sure, is a lot easier because you get to see everybody and like the festivities are big. But for me, it was fucking hard. Fucking hard, okay? I have PTSD from it. Well, speaking of PTSD, Gail comes up to Sydney with Cotton and springs a surprise interview on her. Oh my god, yeah. What a dick move. And true to Sydney, she punches Gail in the face. They have such a strange dynamic to me. It's love-hate. Yeah. But that seems to be the relationship Gail has with anybody she runs into. True, because then we get her reunion union with Dewey, who's like, my name is Dwight. He basically confronts her about what she wrote in the book about him, saying that he was a bumbling idiot, didn't have the experience to be working this case. Gail basically says, I exaggerated it for the book. It's very funny because they clearly have feelings for each other. I also find it really funny because they are an actual couple. They were married for quite a few years, David Arquette and Courtney Cox. So imagine acting opposite your partner like you hate each other, but still love each other. Maybe it's really accurate to their relationship. It's a really cheesy dynamic in the film. So I'm wondering if it just translated that way. It's possible that they were already romantically involved. So that's why it comes off super cheesy. I don't know. He's like, maybe I use my inexperience to get under the radar so that people are not expecting of me. Maybe I'm the killer. Did you not think that? Again, if he does end up being the killer in later movies, I bet people who know this franchise, love this franchise, are like screaming at us like, how do you not know? <laughs> Look, I think it helps our case on these episodes to not know. I think it's it funner. It our genuine reaction, reaction to things. Yeah. Cotton is upset with Gail because... Cotton's like, I thought Sid knew that we were having a interview. We were going to do 10 minutes. Yeah, he is a more prominent character than in the first film. His character is funny. Funny because you think he's a fucking creep. And he is. I mean, honestly, the way he treats Sid later in the library, I can't pretend to like him. But I guess taking a step aside, maybe just that he's an awkward dude. Later, he's kind of like, I don't give a shit about what just happened. Can I get my 15 minutes with Diane Sawyer? So that's all he cares about. And I think he's literally there just to be like a red herring. Yeah. The sorority sisters have convinced Sidney to 
to go to a party. We get the scene of Sarah Michelle Gellar babysitting the sorority house for another sorority. I'm tired of Sarah Michelle Gellar getting killed in horror movies when she's Buffy. I know. I know. Everyone knew her as a scream queen. She started in I Know What You Did Last Summer. She did a few films like this. She got Buffy the same year. 97 is when the first season of Buffy premiered. Oh, fun. I just see her as Buffy. It's super weird to not see her turn around and just kick the killer's ass. (laughs) I guess jumping ahead, but the killer literally just effortlessly throws her over the balcony like she weighs nothing. She was putting up a pretty good fight. She gets a call from someone she believes to be the guy that she's hooking up with at the time, but it is Ghostface messing with her true to his MO of calling people before killing them. And it's a little comical because as one of the last sorority sisters leaves after she's like hung up on the phone with this person, Ghostface sneaks in in the background. (laughs) (laughs) Oh yeah, I saw that. Cece gets startle scared. And the sorority girl hears the phone ring takes it answers the phone and he's like it's ted oh okay it's your good for nothing boyfriend yeah basically and hands it back to cc and is like all right bye okay thanks there's some very 90s things here that i wanted to point out her tiny eyebrows <laughs> and the clear phones you remember the clear phones wanted yes. one of those so bad <laughs> there's a lot of clear stuff i had a clear game boy yeah clear was like <laughs> the shit in the 90s <laughs> you remember those like inflatable clear chairs also really wanted one of those <laughs> eventually she catches on to the killer being inside the house. When Cece tries to go outside and call the cops, the phone seems to be getting messed with as far as signal goes. And I was like, how would you even do that? She had to have a device that scrambled the signal to the phone itself. You don't know that this is Mrs. Loomis at the time. She's a reporter that's stalking Gail. Gail treats her like absolute garbage. And I feel like that's kind of a trope in horror movies too, where the character that gets treated like crap ends up being the killer. So I saw that and I'm like, I think she's the killer right away. I almost felt bad for her because she seems like an amateur reporter the entire time. Yes. But he chases her upstairs. He throws her out the window first. He stabs her on the balcony and then throws her off the side. This is where I probably thought Mickey is the killer because Mrs. Loomis looks to be the size of Sarah Michelle Gellar and I don't imagine she would have that easily like it literally looks like a ragdoll the way that she gets thrown off the balcony you were suspicious of Mickey from the get-go there is something about his character looking a lot like Billy that makes you think like uh this guy's sketchy I can see that movie being so self-aware Randy specifically says if it's the boyfriend again and his friend then it's old news it's predictable so we gotta go somewhere else with the story so I was like no that's too obvious but then it was the answer (laughs) we got the scene of Mickey so I guess maybe it wasn't Mickey doing the murdering because he's here at this party. He's arguing with Randy about the sequel still. Sydney's trying to like mingle, but she's not having a great time because the sorority is like very obviously trying to recruit her. The party ends when they hear the sirens. Immediately everyone finds out that there was another murder. Gail is pissed that this other reporter was there first. Is yelling at Joel, mistreats Joel, her other cameraman. Dewey tells her, you'd be happy if it was happening again. Gail seems to feel a little guilty but doesn't give a shit because again she's a woman of business as the party's being evacuated the phone continues to ring sydney has gone back for her jacket and she goes and answer it i think if i were sydney i'd never answer a phone again i'd be like text me text me it's coming in a few <laughs> years it probably already exists but it's like really expensive i don't care <laughs> if you want to talk to me i'd be surprised if it didn't already exist there were phones in cars i didn't even know that yeah you didn't I you really were really did not surprised even know that. <laughs> during texas but it is Ghostface once again harassing Sydney, and immediately we jump into the action. I love the way that Ghostface appears. She answers the phone. She's done as fuck. She's like, you know what? Yeah, come say it to my face. Show your face. He's like, okay. <laughs> and then be right there. Bleh! Yeah. Shows up right behind her. This movie's so fast paced that we just gotta like get into it. She's calling for him. He realizes that something's going on. We get the knife through the door. She's running away from the killer and he goes in to help her. And then later is like, why did you come back into the house? Bitch, you were screaming my name. (laughs) But she was already outside. But she got trapped in there, didn't she? She had to escape through the back. When she finds Derek, he finds her outside. He pushes her aside and runs into the house. And conveniently gets stabbed. On the arm. Not hitting anything vital at all. And that's when he becomes a suspect because they're like, oh, how convenient that Ghostface didn't just kill you. Which is something that Dewey is saying because he also ran in after the stabbing to help Derek. Gail, the cops, Dewey, and Randy, they're sitting around and they're thinking, Gail points out after the main lieutenant or whatever he is puts all the names of the victims i didn't write down all the names but you see maureen you see one that's last name i believe is stevens and there's another one that was oh i wish i wrote this down because it was very specific but gail points out 
these names are similar to victims from the first film, either by first name or last name. There's two detectives who have been following Sydney around, so Derek's kind of pissed because he's like, do they have to follow us around all the time? They're obvious as fuck, too. They're like literally walking five steps behind them. I think they should be obvious, though. That way the killer doesn't try something. It doesn't end up working in the library scene, but I have an issue with that because if your whole job is to protect a person, why are you leaving them alone? <laughs> if your whole job is to protect a person, don't get fucking murdered at a red light. Jesus. Also, was... Ghostface does what Jason didn't. This guy just hands through the window and kills these two detectives. That's so anyway, true. Ghostface has learned from the from these previous movies. mistakes. We get the awkward conversation that Sydney is having with Derek where it's obvious that she's not trusting him so much and kind of wants them to be at least a little less involved while this whole investigation is going on. Derek kind of doesn't take it well, kind of takes it well. He says, like, I should be understanding, right? And then just walks away. He's it's... supposed to play this role that he's understanding, but almost seems pissed that he has to. Yeah, it's undercut with some ulterior feelings. She says, fucking leave me alone. And in the next scene, and he's you know at what he lunch does? and is like, here are my fraternity letters and a necklace and then sings on top of a bunch of tables. What the hell are your letters going to do, first of all? You know, it's so important when you're in college, your letters, because they even mention like, oh, he just did that. He's going to get his ass kicked by his fraternity brothers later. Yeah. It's a big no-no. Yeah, it is. I but mean, it's supposed to be a big declaration of love. I think this is where we get the scene of the Stab movie. This scene is hilarious because it's Luke Wilson playing Billy. I would love to see Stab. I think I would do. I guess we do. It's called Scary Movie. No, I want to see this one. This is where we get that great speech from Randy on what makes a sequel. So we have a higher kill count. It's got to be gorier. It's got to be flashier. More gruesome death. And the absolute final rule, if you want to have a sequel, is... And this is where Dewey interrupts him and he's like, but we know who the killer is. So he's saying you should never reveal who your killer is in the first movie. I don't know if that holds true. You know who the killers are in every movie we've seen so far. Rule number one, kill count has to be way higher. Did Nightmare do it? Kind of, because there was the whole pool party where a lot of people got killed. Sure. But they were not more gruesome. Did Friday the 13th do it? I don't know. I don't know either. I I would say that about the same amount get killed. Yeah, I wouldn't say it was like a lot higher. And then did Texas? do it no texas was really tame i think there was like four kills total in the whole movie lg the two guys from the beginning and and right if you want to count the grenade and if you want to count the sawyer's deaths more gory more flashy kills nightmare 2 did not have as flashy kills friday 1 also did it better yes did texas better. 2 is the only one that had more gruesome kills than the first you had savini in too yeah you got savini you're gonna get more gory did they reveal the killer in all three yes yes but since Freddy <laughs> is kind of a dream creature, he can always come back. Right, Miss Voorhees was revealed. And then we get Jason, who goes on to be the actual killer for the rest of the franchise. Texas is a little different because it's not a huge franchise that has like a million sequels. They kind of start over and do remakes and do retellings or like origin stories of the same killer. But it's a franchise. It is, but it's definitely not like... Friday the 13th, that every film is different, or even Michael, which has different timelines. I would say that Halloween's in the same boat as Texas. If it's getting remade, it's a franchise, isn't it? So whatever Randy was trying to say about the killer being revealed at the end, they all did. So Dewey and Randy continue this conversation, and they're like, all right, who could it be? Is it Derek? No, no, it's got to be Mickey. But then they're like, well, if Mickey's... The suspect, because he's a film student, he knows about what happened in the first one. Dewey's like, well, then if that's the case, you are also a suspect. And he's like, oh, no, no. I'm the perpetual love slave to Sydney. That's oh, yeah. my role. And he's like, good point, good point. Let's move on. Randy's like, you could be a suspect yourself. And Gail. And then Dewey's like, oh, yeah, you're right. Let's just move on. Randy's like, well, if Gail isn't the suspect, then she's potentially a target. And Dewey is like, oh, shit. The next thing we get is Gail talking to Joel, her cameraman, who is like, you know what? I'm quitting. I came here to report on the news, not be the news. I saw what happened to your old cameraman. I read your book. I think it's a good line. We get this weird art director, dude. I don't know. His conversation with Sydney seemed really like personal and weird (laughs) he's projecting on her yeah also the play that she goes on to do seems extremely trauma inducing because they're literally all hooded figures wearing masks i would be like hell no (laughs) i'm not starring in this play have you heard what happened to me yeah it's also just very close to what her story is in this movie that she has to deal with everyone kind of being out to kill her it's too close for comfort for sid she goes on stage to act out the scene the production value on this play i have never been to a play this Even if it is a college. This immaculate. This intricate (laughs) in college. Immaculate. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, because they got thunder. They got 
backdrops dropping. I was like, wow, this is awesome. <laughs> I wasn't an art kid, but I'm pretty sure my college did not have this kind of budget. My college hated fun, so we never even did Hated place. fun. <laughs> yeah. It was an engineering school, okay? We're all depressed. We just go to school, get bad grades, and then do our math, somehow. and then leave. It's not clear if the actual killer is within the play of actors, or she's just, like I said, having a trauma flashback, because this is all very close to her actual life. Even you as a viewer are confused on whether she's actually seeing Ghostface or not. They've got knives, they've got masks. Some of them even have open mouths like just the like Ghostface mask. Ghostface. Yeah. She has a breakdown. Rightfully so, but also don't be in this play. Yeah, as the main character. I was like, no, there's a bunch of people here literally wearing masks. Everyone can take it off for rehearsal, people. True. Why well, are we this dressed up for rehearsal? The teacher basically alludes to Sydney being like Cassandra. She sealed her own fate and had control over her fate. So he said that Sydney should embrace it rather than be afraid of it. Real easy to say, man. No one's chasing <laughs> you to murder you. He's behind it all. He's actually married to Miss Loomis. Plot twist. Yeah. So the film is giving you probably three suspects you're thinking might be the killer already and picking them off, basically. Gail does get a phone call from the killer. I'm surprised her cell phone's not like massive like the other one. In 97? Yeah, they're a little bit smaller. <laughs> they're all talking around this tree on campus. Randy takes the phone, talking to the killer. The killer's like, oh, am I interrupting something? And obviously can see the three of them. And is joking around with them. Randy stays to talk to them while Gail and Dewey try to find them because they're like, they have to be around here and they're going around taking phones and kicking things over and pushing people they even chase one guy down in the background the yeah. like, Fuck. <laughs> i would hate to be these people that's <laughs> like what is your problem while randy i don't think this is smart on his part he starts walking around and wandering if you've seen enough horror movies randy you should have stayed in one spot yeah but you would think you'd be safe because it's so open like if i was running from somebody what i would do is avoid being in an enclosed space and would want to do like what he's doing and go in the middle of the campus you would have to be able to see where someone's coming from right he was literally killed in the middle of the day with no witnesses <laughs> meanwhile dewey and gail are trashing everybody's shit that's who they <laughs> were paying attention to but randy's going off on the killer about how billy the original killer was just a homo repressed mama's boy it reminds me of when we talked about how Stu and billy had this potentially gay relationship or not he says homo repressed and that's when the killer just goes off on him drags him into the white van like the beer and <laughs> stabs him to death i was so sad Wanted randy yeah to i loved randy's character i don't know if this would even happen but so much much blood pools up that it starts to spill out the side of the van. I guess it would depend on how deep your wounds are, but also I don't know how much blood is in the human body. We've talked about this. I think we've questioned this before. Ten pints. Ten pints. <laughs> While this is happening, Sydney is in the library and starts getting these weird IM messages. They look really funny. I don't think any IM. I don't think they looked like, like this, this back then. At the time, we were using like AOL and Yahoo. Maybe they couldn't get the rights to use that. In That's what video. I'm thinking. They like didn't want to get sued or something. <laughs> Schools used to have their own things like that. I used to go to a certain college for a summer program in high school, and they had their own specific IM. Yeah. That's before my time. <laughs> 2006. Yes. <laughs> way, way back. But Sydney's freaking out and trying to look over each computer to see who could be sending her these messages. She calls over the detectives that are following her. And they start roughhousing with everybody in the library. <laughs> everyone, making everyone step away from the computers. What doesn't make sense to me is that they make her wait by herself in the corner of a library. I really think someone should have stayed with her the whole time. This gives Cotton the opportunity to surprise Sydney. Sydney is automatically suspicious of him. I am too. Why is he still at the college? <laughs> yeah, he said he was only there for for the 10 minute interview. Well, we know why he's still there. He is super heavily interested in getting this Diane Sawyer interview. He's like, we'll each get 10,000 bucks. Come on, it's our 15 minutes of fame. I think it's also just the notoriety of being on Diane Sawyer because it would probably lead to more interviews and more money. I wish I knew more about the Diane Sawyer thing because the only other time that I've seen her name mentioned is when Robert Downey Jr. was interviewed by that one weird guy. He was there to do like an Avengers interview and it was supposed to be fun. And some dude is like, do you think that you resonate closely with the Tony Stark role because you had such a horrible relationship with your father? And Robert Downey Jr. is like, uh, what? And yeah. this is supposed to be like a fun interview and the guy just went straight for the head. Cutthroat. Robert Downey Jr. is like, uh, you're getting a little too Diane Sawyer for me starts taking all his stuff off and gets up yeah because i think she's known for like being a very tough interviewer god i feel like she was again popular during this time it was a little bit before us because i would say that for this generation and i don't really know but yeah that is what he's after and he's like very much like intimidating her she's already freaked out he's but... moving her face he's shoving her he's kind of closing her in in this corner behind the bookcase because he feels he's owed something for her 
accusing him, sending him wrongfully to jail. But I feel like he's kind of been milking this already for a while. Not to say that like the wasting a year of your life isn't something to be upset about, but he is getting profit out of it. And he just wants like the top tier best he can get. While he's doing this, the detectives notice and they immediately assume he's a suspect because why is he doing this, right? From an outside point of view, you're like, what the fuck are you doing? He's the suspect number one. He was accused for a year. So the next thing we get is them taking him to the police station. As he's pulled out, there's that amateur reporter we keep seeing. Gil freaks the fuck out on this lady. She's super mean to her the entire time. This is where Sydney gets the news that Randy has died. She's obviously pretty upset. You know, they're like the kids that survived the first incident. She's saying that she has to call his mother. Dewey says that he already took care of that. Cotton is released because they don't really have anything to hold him on. Other than that, he was pushy. And he's like, well, you're going to do arrest me because I was loud in the library. Funny, but also he has a point. And he runs into Gail and Gail's also suspicious of him now and is telling him not to do anything that he'll regret. She has her reputation on the line if Cotton is also found Found. not innocent, right? Because she wrote this whole book that was around him. Very instrumental in getting him released. Outside the police station, we get the scene where Joel quits. Dewey and her continue this weird romantic subplot that they've got going on because they take the tapes and go watch them immediately thinking that the killer must be in the footage somewhere. They're like, where do we go to get a VCR? Was a VCR not that common at this time? I thought it was. I think it is. They're just in a college and they don't know where they can go watch where, the tapes. But again, where is this college? It's very well oh, funded because they have where the VCR is and stuff and then they also have like a literal recording studio. Well, this school just seems to be really into the arts. Probably an arts school. Yeah. They put the tapes in and they start to see all the footage. They get in the mood while watching the footage. Because they see like their interaction, like the cameraman had recorded their first fight and they're kind of like apologizing for it, obviously. It's so like, awkward. Making out, <laughs> yeah. Again, it's like this weird some romantic plot and it's like, okay, but there's a killer on the list. It's like the teenagers that stopped to do it in the forest. The whole time you're also suspicious of Dewey, at least I was. Dewey's here now with her in an intimate way. Moment. Yeah, this is Dewey's chance to kill her. But instead, the TV starts to show the scenes of the previous murders and ends with the camera pointed at them. It means the killer's been recording everything that's happened as well. This is kind of fucked up. Not only do they kill, but they're taking evidence, right? I think it's just because we do know that the killer is Mrs. Loomis, who is a reporter. Oh, true. She could be recording these for profit later on. Or she's trying to frame Mickey if things go wrong. When Dewey and Gail look up, they see Ghostface in the projection room Mm -hmm. and Ghostface runs, so Dewey chases after and Gail is surprise attacked by Ghostface who chases after her. Ah, yes. We get Gail running around Scooby-Doo style (laughs) through the doors. She does eventually hide from Ghostface. What she doesn't see is that she ends up in a what looks like the front end of a recording studio. It's like a sound booth. The glass is also soundproof. Because behind her is Dewey banging on the glass, trying to get her attention, but it is way too late because Ghostface is in there with him, stabbing him, and she does not realize it until she turns around and sees them through the glass. She cannot do anything about it. Someone later makes a comment that Gail has more lives than a cat. I think yeah. It's and yeah. I think Dewey is the same way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. This scene is probably the most suspenseful in the entire film. Because you're trying to root for Gail not to die. She turns a corner, you see Ghostface in the back. She turns another corner, you see Ghostface in the back. He's pretty much on her. If it weren't for her locking herself in that one room, I think he'd have gotten her. Yeah. Or she. We don't know who's the one running around right now. The next scene is Sydney getting essentially taken away for witness protection. Sydney, no longer feeling safe at college, just being taken away. Her friend, Hallie, says she's going with her because she's her therapist. Derek also is saying bye to her. Although he doesn't agree, he's like, I have to be supportive. Ugh. Ugh, you're being murdered. How difficult for me yeah. to be supportive. So he watches them drive off, and immediately after, you see a hooded figure in the back, and you're thinking it's Ghostface. And because they're sprinting comically again <laughs> yeah. through the trees and stuff. That's his brothers who are taking him. Yesterday, I found out that there's a word for giving your letters to yeah. your girlfriend via a necklace. It's called lavalier. Never even heard of this. We just knew don't give your letters to anybody. It's a no-no. So Ghostface attacks the car immediately after this, which I thought was pretty ballsy. At this point, Ghostface has been inconspicuous in that they're pretty careful at how they're attacking. And to go and attack a cop car and kill two detectives, that's pretty... Pretty fucking ballsy. It really is. 
the fact that they're cops, you know, like you're not going to get away with that. <laughs> and I see this because we've seen it in the past. Like we've seen cops killed before, but we've seen cops killed by villains who have nothing to lose. And in this case, you're thinking Ghostface is the most human of all three, I'd say. Uh, well, I guess Texas is also human, but they're insane. And Ghostface is clearly a person who cares about not being found out until they reveal until themselves the end of the movie. Yeah. <laughs> well, I think it's just that thing of when you realize that it's Mrs. Loomis, it's just motivated by revenge and she kind of does not care anymore. Her target is Sydney. After Ghostface attacks, takes the car, the cop that's outside jumps on top of the hood. Ghostface crashes into construction and a metal bar mm-hmm. just goes straight through the head of the cop on the hood. That was brutal because Sydney and Hallie are in the back like, fuck! Yeah, no, <laughs> that's insanely traumatizing again. Sydney needs real therapy. Yeah. Sydney and Holly are now trapped in the back of the car a cop car like it's designed for you not to get out child lock again and you said the most tense scene is when gail's being chased for me it's this scene where sydney's crawling out of the back seat of the car crawling over ghost face i don't think this scene is suspenseful because i think she was an idiot and should have just killed them she goes for the mask and then accidentally pushes the horn and stops and then goes again and then hallie has to do it like he's clearly knocked out or she tied him up kill them well i think sydney wanted to probably wanted to see who it was first and then would killed them because we know she has no problem killing the killer but her friend is the one who's like don't even worry about that let's just get the hell out of here i was so sad for hallie too she didn't deserve it yeah as they're running it's away, sydney's fault she dies as they're running away sydney goes back and she's like i have to know i have to know who it is and hallie's like uh, no you don't we can find out later the killer waits for sydney to go all the way back to the car and check and realize that they are not there she turns around the killer is right behind hallie attacking her from behind and Stabbing her in the gut. A lot of gut cutting. Kind of, um, would you say their MO for screen? Gut cutting? Stabbing the gut. Gut cutting or backstabbing? One or the other. <laughs> because this is happening simultaneously, Gail runs out of the building where Dewey was killed and runs into Cotton. Cotton has blood on his hand. Gail is like, oh shit, it's Ghostface. And Cotton's like, no, I found Dewey. I was trying to help him. That's what this is about. But and really Gail runs away. It is, yeah. Cotton looks at his hands and is like, fuck. He's like this character that's a fine line of like comical and he still might be the killer. Yeah. Sid goes to the theater automatically for some reason. She just ends up there as she's running away from Ghostface. Instead of going to the cops? They did. The two of them, and there's more. <laughs> did the monster from Malignant go and kill everybody at the precinct? Yeah, too? yeah. while that's happening, <laughs> the entire precinct is dying. <laughs> for some reason, the killer knew that she was going to end up there because Derek comes down from the ceiling tied up. You honestly think Derek's dead, but he regains consciousness and she is trying to take him down from this weird star thing. That's when Ghostface appears and is like, hey, it's me the whole time. It's Mickey. And he pretends that Derek is in on it with him. Yeah. And he's like, look, it's, it's not just me. Just like in the first one, it was always the boyfriend and the crazy friend. It's gotta be Derek. And Derek's like, what? No, like, that's not true. Sydney has no reason not to believe Mickey's right. Yeah, because you probably have trust issues after that. Also, Mickey being the killer is kind of funny because he was only in like a couple scenes at the beginning and you don't see him again throughout the rest of the film. He looks crazy. Yeah, he's like Billy in another dude's body. Yeah, he's almost like Stu and Billy in one. Love child. He shoots Derek just to mess with her. Basically saying like, you believed me and it got your perfect boyfriend killed. And I think Derek with his dying words is like, I would have never done anything to hurt you. And honestly, I'm like, Derek, you were so boring. Like, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> cool. Great. You already did something to hurt me. You fucking sang in front of the entire lunchroom. And that was pretty embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Mickey kind of goes back to what was being talked about in the film class where he's like, it's the perfect storm. It's almost like a cotton situation where he is really interested in what's going to happen after the fact. And he's like, I'm going to go on trial. It's going to be this whole spectacle. I'm going to be fine because everyone's going to be like, oh, wow, the copycat killer who did exactly what happened in the first one. And it's funny because it's the opposite of what Billy had said in the first film. He was like, movies don't make killers. They make killers more creative. But this guy's like, no, no, no. I am blaming the movies completely for this. He's right. This time in the 90s, it was like trials were blowing up. This is the time of the O.J. Simpson trial. The John Bonet Ramsey case was happening. I don't know if that actually went to trial because no one was a suspect, but like... No, there were suspects. Just there, no one was like... Yeah, there was no like yeah. accused. It's this time where court 
was being televised, it's a commentary on the true crime community. He feels like he can become famous by being the killer. And that he'll be safe. Yes, because he'll be so sensationalized. He's like, and obviously I wasn't working alone. A door opens and Gail walks through and you're like, oh, oh shit. Sure. But she's got a gun to her back and it's Mrs. Loomis. But she's still in Ghostface, so you yes. still don't know who it is. Yeah, it's not just like, <laughs> oh yeah, we're supposed to know who that character is. She does eventually take off her mask. Sydney's the only one that recognizes her as Billy's mom. And Gail's like, wait. Has Sydney just not seen her at all this whole time? She's been at every crime scene. She's been there as a reporter, but she says she didn't recognize her because she lost like 60 pounds and oh, has yeah. gotten work done. Because Gail's like, wait, no, I like interviewed her and that's not her. And she's like, no, it's her. She you know, Gail doesn't surgery. care about who she really talks to in interviews, so maybe she didn't recognize her. By work done, I thought you meant she got like plastic surgery yeah. to change her face. I think she got like some work done. Because when you lose weight, your appearance does change, so maybe she just tweaked some things so she wouldn't be so suspicious yeah because then they're like Billy's mom's on every crime scene someone's gonna say something I'm trying to look up the actor who plays Mrs. Loomis because I'm pretty sure she plays Jackie and Roseanne I don't know I don't watch Roseanne you didn't watch Roseanne no isn't she racist Roseanne is racist, not the rest of the oh, cast. Okay. They went on to do her show without her. Oh. They killed her off her oh. own show because she was so racist. Isn't that a comedy? It's been going on for so long, but it was kind of like a dark comedy. That's weird. Sorry, that I got distracted. <laughs> what was your question? <laughs> <laughs> I was just saying that. What did you recognize her? You said that Sydney recognizes that it's Billy's mom, but others would have too. Like Dewey? Did possibly Dewey interact with her at all? He was a cop at the precinct where the first things happened. It seems like any time that Dewey runs into Gail, she's just told off. The reporter. So he doesn't see her. He, like, just misses her every mm. time. Interesting. Yeah. Gail is the only one that interacts with her. Yes. So, if anything, it's Gail's fault. <laughs> it, it, it really is Gail's fault. Okay. Yeah. God damn it, Monica. And Jennifer Aniston's naked body. As she reveals herself, in the country at the time, she says that there were 97 serial killers today. In 2021, apparently there's 30 active serial killers, which I think is still pretty high, given that we just said in this last episode that serial killers are having a hard time existing. For it to have been, what, 24 years since this movie came out, and the number to only be 30% of what it was before, sure, it's better, but yeah. it's still a pretty significant amount. 30 is a pretty high number. You're taking probably the right approach of being <laughs> like, that is still too high. I'm actually like, huh, that's actually decreased a lot. <laughs> that's not even one per state. <laughs> that's still too high for you. Well, yeah, because if we talk about 2021, you'd think like we're advanced. We know what to do. We have DNA. We have, we have internet. We have phones. Everywhere. 30 is still pretty fucking high. So this is an argument for the people that are like, the government knows everything and you're in all our business. No, there's still 30 people out there doing it. <laughs> yeah. And that's also subject to, well, how many people are they killing? Because it seems to be classified as a serial killer. You have to kill more than two. So it could really just be 30 people who've killed just two people and they're serial killers automatically. Because honestly, we got shit ton of serial killers in Chicago. Oh, yeah. Does this account for like gang um, violence, sides. spree killings, and, like mass shootings and if, like that? I've always wondered how you kind of distinguish the two because there's like organized crime. Serial killings, sure, could be like one person or two who are on a spree that haven't been discovered. But wouldn't you say the same thing about organized crime? That's true. And I'm literally looking up. How many kills to be considered a serial killer? Like, I am going to get flagged somewhere. <laughs> Three is a normal definition by the FBI. Is it because it's a job? It's different? It's not a serial killer anymore? If you get benefits from it. Uh, don't most serial killers get benefits out of things? I mean, yeah. Like, in this case, she wants to kill Sid for revenge on her kid. Yes. And Nikki's the one that, like, isn't really getting something out of it. He just wants to be famous. But we find out that doesn't come to be because Mrs. Loomis just tired of his shit. Shoots him dead. A lot. Yeah. A couple times. Enough for him <laughs> to not pop up the way he does in the yeah. end. <laughs> So yeah, she shoots Gail, and Gail falls off the stage. So it's just Sid and Miss Loomis. Miss Loomis goes into this whole thing. It's classic villain, tell your whole plot to the hero situation. And she's like, you probably think that I'm here because of my own motive or movies or whatever. She's like, no, I'm here for good old-fashioned revenge yeah. on my son. Just thinking Mrs. Voorhees vibes this whole time. Sydney says, you're as crazy as Billy. And Loomis is like, what did you just say to me? <laughs> but Sydney's right. And she revealed that that's why she killed Randy because he started talking crap about Billy and she couldn't help herself. Yeah. Sydney's like, it starts with the family and Miss Loomis goes into this whole defense mode where she's like, it doesn't start with the family. I raised my kid the best that I could. She blames something. Her mother again. Sydney's mom. Oh, yeah, that's right. She blames like, Sydney's damn, mom. Sydney really like suffered for the sins of her mom. But I would argue that they all just really fixated on blaming Sydney's mom. But like, I think your husband's the one that ruined your family. Right. I also don't know what happened 
and Billy's dad. Can't remember. Did he die in the first one? Like off screen, it was mentioned. I can't remember either. But we just looked it up and Hank Loomis. It says that he appeared in Scream 1. I don't really remember. I kind of remember now because it was like the whole issue with the cell phone and Cindy being suspicious and he kept being like, call my dad. He's a lawyer. He appears in Scream 3. So we'll see him again. Stay tuned. Yeah. Sydney gets Miss Loomis distracted because she's like, wait, wasn't Mickey supposed to be dead? And she turns around. (laughs) And lunges for the gun. It's interesting because Ghostface is a knives villain and they're fighting for a gun in the last scenes. Didn't Billy have a gun? Yes, but I think Stu had the knife. I think it's once they take this persona of Ghostface off. Oh. Yeah, it's everything goes. Sydney has gone into the control room and has started to use, just like she did, started to use the props and everything from the theater against Mrs. Loomis. Mrs. Loomis is kind of like in this state of hysteria. And yeah. so all these little things that are happening with the theater are catching her off guard for the same reason that she's not 100%. She's so focused on revenge against Sydney that she's like, can't handle all the stage <laughs> props following. She's overstimulated. She's- at the end, this fake rebel lands on top of her, like in a like it would really hurt action movie. Yeah. Yeah. I was thinking, I'm like, it's just foam. She passes out, like but she's like, fuck, yeah. deal. <laughs> Mrs. Loomis has caught Sydney, and you really think like this is gonna be it for her. Nobody else is alive to help her, and that's when Cotton comes in, and I think it's when Mrs. Loomis turns around and holds. Sydney at gunpoint because Cotton's pointing the gun at both of them. He kind of just walked into the situation <laughs> and doesn't know what's going on. You think he's a wild card because he has reasons to hate Sydney. So you're like, is he going to shoot her? And then Miss Loomis is also using what she knows about Cotton and is like, look, let me just kill her, please. Let you me just kill her, her and I will put you in front of Diane Sawyer. Yeah. You hate her too. Like, I know you do. She put you away for so long. And, and Cotton's like, hmm, damn, you fucking right. Yeah, he looks like he's being convinced <laughs> and then he turns to Sydney and is like, Diane Sawyer's looking pretty good. I know, and Sydney's like, consider it done. Boom. <laughs> he killed yeah. Mrs. Lewis. That's all he wanted. <laughs> it's pretty funny. That's all he wanted, yeah. yeah. It's so funny. I like this actor. What's his name? Liv Scheiber. He plays Sabretooth in the worst Wolverine film. Wolverine Origins, the one where they fucked up Deadpool. I loved him, actually, as Sabretooth. Like, it was awesome casting. Yeah, he's got a very, like specific look to him that makes me think like he used to be like a pro wrestler turned actor <laughs> you know what I mean yeah honestly I, I swear can we bring back Luke Trevor as Sabretooth I think he's like too, too old, old to bring man. into the MCU because mm-hmm. yeah, it seems like they're getting younger people so that they could last a few years not to say he's too old to act he has to know because Angelina Jolie older and she's in the Eternals. I think the Eternals so works different though because they're supposed to be beings that have been here beings. for a long time. Yeah. Because there's still young characters in the Eternals. There's like, I think a literal kid. A literal child. Yeah. <laughs> All the Starks are in it. San Hua from Train to Busan. Here for it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I hope he kicks people's asses for no reason. Him and what's his name? Kumail. Kumail. I forgot his last name. I love him too. I'm yeah. watching it just for those <laughs> two actors. Tangent. <laughs> <laughs> so I think it's at this point you're surprised by Gail popping up. It seems like she's only gotten shot in the shoulder, nowhere vital. And I think this is where Cotton's like, God damn it, Gail, you have more lives than a cat. <laughs> yeah. Cotton's also talking to Sydney and is like, look, we need to get our story straight. And I think about this all the time when these movies end. What happens, right? Like, you're a suspect because you've just killed in self-defense. But I've heard so many times where... Even if you kill someone in self-defense, you still are a murderer because of some tiny little stupid detail. You know how there's different types of manslaughter? There's like different sentences for if you're accused of one versus the other. Like manslaughter one, obviously, I think it's the worst one that you could commit. It's like intention. Then there's like man two, which is like less time because there was other circumstances. And I think it just, this is what I mean. We need a section (laughs) where Brenda comes on and (laughs) explains the legal jargon to us. Yeah, because I'm sure kind coming in here thinking like well I just killed a lady and I to blame Sydney let's let's get our stories together because I don't want to be blamed for this shit and then again. jail again <laughs> but I think when you do it in defense of someone else it's also like justifiable state laws depends some states are different than others oh my god like where are they Ohio if they were in freaking Florida or Texas that has that standard ground rule no one would go to jail that'd be fine <sighs> Texas the world <laughs> Texas so they're all kind of having a good time talking about what happened? I don't everyone's think it's a good happy. Time. Hold on, everyone's happy that Gail's alive. It's one of those oh thank God really? it's over kind of situations. And Mickey's like ah, <laughs> flailing and bloody. And both Sydney and Gail turn around with their guns turned sideways and shoot him. Basically, just like <laughs> nonstop, like going at him. He goes flying backwards into the rubble, the foam rubble from earlier. 
they're waiting for it. They're looking down at Mrs. Loomis and Cotton's like, do you think she's dead or they're going to pop back up? And then Sydney's like, they always do. And that's when Mickey's like, ah! Yeah. After they unload their clips into him, <laughs> turn around. And Sydney, I guess with her final bullet, shoots Mrs. Loomis in the head. And it's like, just in case. She applies the double tap rule, so she would have survived the zombie apocalypse. She's she- also a fighter. Like, I think we kind of glazed over that, but she like punches and kicks and took maybe some self-defense classes. She just looks Tough. tougher compared to the other actresses. You gotta. You're fighting off murderers every year. Everything's getting wrapped up. They're getting treated by the ambulances. And Founded by the press. Gail finds out that Dewey's alive because he's getting pulled out in a stretcher, so she's happy. She goes into the truck with Dewey. He survived because the killer stabbed him in his scar tissue. His existing. <laughs> his existing stab. <laughs> what are the fucking odds of that? That's why Dewey's so suspicious. That's, and I think he becomes a killer later, so... Mm. We'll see. He becomes the killer later because he's fucking pissed and he's always getting stabbed in the same spot. I would too, after <laughs> yeah. all this trauma. It's Sydney, it's your fault. I don't even care about any of it. I'm just If here. you die, this ends. <laughs> Sid is outside and like you said, the reporters go to swarm her. And Sid's like, you know what? Because Cotton's at his car by himself. Go talk to him. He's the real hero here. Cotton takes advantage and is reveling in it. And he's like, wait for the movie. And the final scene we get is Sydney walking alone on campus, which I kind of find sad because once again, all her friends are dead. She has no support. She could have gone with Dewey and Gail to the hospital. She probably should have. (laughs) Just so she's not alone? Yeah. She's just like walking on campus like another day, another romantic teen movie. Meanwhile, the next ghost face is walking around in the background. I know. And we get the end title card that says it was directed by Wes Craven. What a wild ride. (laughs) So wild we had to record this in two parts. Yes. You won't notice it, though. I hope not. You <laughs> maybe will if we sound groggy. What did you think of the movie? I thought it was awesome. I like these movies. I love the confusion all the time. Keep yeah, you on your toes. I agree. I really like these. I can't believe I waited so long to watch them. They're so self-aware, so chaotic, and funny. And you're actually sad to see some of the people die. Yeah. I feel like in other movies, you're like, oh, well, there's oh a good, there yeah. goes another one. Still think I like the first one a little better. I think you're always just going to like the original a little better. I think I gave Scream a nine. So I think I'm going to give this one an eight. I'll give it an eight and a half. Still pretty high. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a fun time. I wouldn't say it's scary. There are some suspenseful pieces. I don't know if you say suspense and fear are the same thing. I would say yes. I think actually Jordan Peele says that comedy and horror are really similar because it's like you're building tension and how you release the tension decides if it's horror or comedy. So I feel like you release that tension, you know, when Sydney hits the horn and you're like, oh, fuck. Oh, yeah. I think these films like walk that line pretty well. But do you want to talk about what scared Loki? (laughs) (laughs) I think we already touched on it, but he fucking hated that singing. We were trying to think like, what if I sing? And so I did. Didn't hate it. I was like, maybe it's the clapping because they were singing and clapping and I was singing and clapping. clapping. Yeah, he does. He thinks it's for him all the time. Yeah, I was singing and clapping and he didn't really give a shit. We just think he hated Derek singing. Yeah. (laughs) He's used to you singing well in the house. I'm like, what is this nonsense? Sense. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a better singing voice, Loki? Uh, you also sound like you're crying. You should be in the sad scenes with all the other people who are sad that their family died in these movies. Is there a crying dog movie? Oh, I am sure there is. That sounds too sad. I don't want that. No. No. But as always, we hope you guys had a good time here with us. This one felt a little more chaotic, so if you stick with us, thanks. Yeah. Thanks for listening to us through this Halloween season. We'll see what we're doing in November. I don't know yet. I was talking to some people on Twitter, so we might already have some things planned. Yeah. But you can follow us pretty much anywhere at Shaken Not Scared Pod except Twitter, Twitter is Shaken Scared Pod. You can send us an email at shakenoutscaredpod at gmail.com. You can support the show on Patreon. We'll name our next drink after you with mentions on our website where the drink page will live forever. You can listen to us on all your favorite podcasting sites, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google, Stitcher, a bunch of others. Give us a listen. Give us a follow. Throw Loki his last pumpkin treat. It's, it's over. Yeah. Hey, stay tuned. Don't forget everything that we mentioned earlier in the show. It should be fine. Happy Halloween. Happy Halloween. Okay, thanks. Bye. Bye.